This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by Luke Skywalker Can't Read and Other Geeky Truths, a new essay collection by sci-fi and pop culture guru Ryan Britt. Lev Grossman writes, Ryan Britt is the Virgil you want to guide you through the inferno of geekery. Learn more at ryanbrittwriter.com. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 178 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing what we'd like to see in the new Star Trek TV series that was just announced by CBS, and I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got our producer, John Joseph Adams. He's the editor of Lightspeed and Nightmare Magazines, and also the series editor of Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy. He's also edited many other anthologies, including the recent books Wastelands 2, Operation Arcana, and The End Has Come. He's also now the editor of John Joseph Adams Books, a new science fiction and fantasy imprint of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. So, John, welcome back. Thanks. Good to be here. I'm looking to engage in some good Star Trek debate. <laughs> <laughs> then next up, we've got Raphael Jordan, who you may remember from our panel on the TV shows Killjoys and Dark Matter in episode 167. He's written 23 feature films that have appeared on video and cable television, including Lost Colony, The Legend of Roanoke, The Immortal Voyage of Captain Drake, Star Runners, and Vampire Nation. One of his films, Yeti, was the Sci-Fi Channel's highest-rated original program of 2008. So, Raphael, welcome to the show. Hey, man. Thanks for having me back. Should be fun. And also joining us for the first time is Keith DeCandido. He's the author of dozens of stories, novels, and comics, many of them based on popular TV shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Doctor Who, Stargate SG-1, and Farscape. In the 90s, he interviewed countless science fiction authors as co-host of the public access TV show The Chronic Rift, which is now available as a podcast. He's also written numerous Star Trek books, and he's been reviewing every episode of Deep Space Nine, The Next Generation, and the original series for Tor.com. So, Keith, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. And today's show is brought to you by Luke Skywalker Can't Read and Other Geeky Truths, a new essay collection by Ryan Britt. And here's the description. It says, Ryan Britt got a sex education from Dirty Pictures of Dinosaurs, made out with Jar Jar Binks at midnight, and figured out how to kick depression with a Doctor Who Netflix binge. Alternating between personal anecdote, hilarious insight, and smart analysis, Luke Skywalker Can't Read contends that Barbarella is good for you, that monster movies are just romantic comedies with commitment issues, that Dracula and Sherlock Holmes are total hipsters, and most shocking, that virtually everyone in the Star Wars universe is functionally illiterate. For anyone who pretended their flashlight was a lightsaber, stood in line for a movie at midnight, or dreamed they were abducted by aliens, Luke Skywalker Can't Read is full of answers to questions you haven't thought to ask. And here's a bit more about Ryan. It says, Ryan Britt has written for the New York Times, Electric Literature, The All, Vice Motherboard, Clark's World Magazine, and is a consulting editor for Story Magazine. He was also a staff writer for the Hugo Award-winning website Tor.com, where he remains a contributor. He lives in New York City. And if you live in New York and attend any literary events, you've probably run into Ryan, since he organizes seemingly all of them. So he really knows his stuff, and again, this new book is called Luke Skywalker Can't Read and Other Geeky Truths. And you can learn more about Ryan at ryanbrittwriter.com. Okay, so let's get to our panel. So John and I previously discussed Star Trek back in episodes 64 and 87, so check those out if you missed them. But we've never heard from Raphael or Keith on this before. So let's start with Raphael and have you just tell us a bit about your background as a Star Trek fan. Oh, sure. All right. Um, well, I grew up in the 80s watching all the original series reruns with my dad, and then later we moved on to Next Generation. I just think it was uh, instrumental in turning me into the space science sci-fi sci junkie I am. Um, I think it's also just the most socially relevant sci-fi saga we've got, the way it's influenced so many people into joining the science and tech industries. I mean, it even inspired me to pursue astrophysics, albeit briefly. Then I quickly realized I was a lot better at telling stories about space than doing actual science. <laughs> and how about like all the movies and the, the other shows? Did you ever watch any of those? Oh, absolutely. Um, didn't miss any of it. Um, 
You know, I'm actually a big closet uh, Voyager fan. I know it's <laughs> generally <laughs> ranked at the lowest of the four uh, modern incarnations. Well, five if you include uh, Enterprise. But um, I actually really enjoyed the Voyager crew. I thought they were really good. Um, some of my favorite characters from the whole series were on there. And I just like the idea of the isolation and the lost in space aspect. But um, yeah, I've always thought Trek was better suited for television. The films are fun, but you know, it's the small screen adventures and it's boldly going and the more meditative, it, you know, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, well, so how about Keith? What was your Star Trek background? Um, I, I've been watching Star Trek pretty much since birth. Uh, earlier, if my mother is to be believed. Um, <laughs> the, the, I was born in 1969 when the show was still on the air, and my parents were avid watchers of the original series uh, throughout its entire run. Um, I was born in April of 69, so I only was alive for like the last like five episodes or something. <laughs> uh, but we uh, watching the reruns was appointment television for us when I was a kid growing up. I grew up uh, and still live in New York City, and uh, Channel Eleven here in New York showed Star Trek every every weeknight six o'clock uh, without fail. And what we would do is we would sit, we would watch Star Trek at six o'clock, and then we would have dinner at seven o'clock. That's what we did every every week. That's how I grew up. Um, I've continued to be a Star Trek fan consistently since then, and starting in. Uh, 1999, I got to be professionally involved with it as well when I uh, uh, did a Star Trek comic book for Wildstorm. And from 2000 onward, I've done a ton of Star Trek fiction, uh, mostly for Simon & Schuster, as well as some other comic books for IDW. Uh, most recently, I did a, uh, a coffee table book called The Klingon Art of War. And uh, and I've written about 15 Star Trek novels, a bunch of ebooks, uh, a bunch of short stories. I also edited a monthly line of ebooks called the Starfleet Corps of Engineers, which lasted from 2000 until 2007. Um, I did a bunch of Star Trek anthologies and, and a bunch of other stuff, and I've continued to keep my hand in mostly in the rewatches that you mentioned in my intro. Uh, starting in 2011, I did a rewatch of The Next Generation, where I just I went through each episode uh, and discussed it in a blog entry on Tor.com. When I spent with that, I moved on to Deep Space Nine, and now I'm doing the original series. Right. And so you say, like, obviously, Star Trek has been a big part of your career. Could you just say a little bit more about what is it about Star Trek that uh, sort of interests you so much? What I like in particular about it is the the, the realistic optimism. Um, at its best, Star Trek has always gone with a message of optimism and a message of hope and a message and a message probably most importantly of compassion. Um, in in Star Trek has always been about, you know, the the evil the evil alien monster in Star Trek is actually somebody who's just misunderstood or has a good reason for being a monster or isn't what it appears to be. Like one of my favorite examples would be the uh, the Devil in the Dark, where you've got you know your classic horror movie setup of this horrible monster that's killing people, and it turns out to be a mother protecting her children. Um, it has always carried a message where hope outweighs fear and outweighs cynicism and outweighs negativity. Um, and even when the ideals of it are compromised as they, you know, often are here and there and in many of the stories, um, it always comes back to erring on the side of getting along of compassion of people talking to each other and working out their problems in a civilized manner. Plus the fact that it just proposes the notion of a united earth. <laughs> which is something that seems really far-fetched right now. No, exactly. That's a great point, Keith. I don't know if it's so much a, a realistic optimism, but it's definitely an idealistic optimism that I think is admirable, for sure. I mean, that's the future we would want. You know, that's the best future we've seen in fiction, really. Yeah, yeah. All right, so when we talked about Star Trek on the show before, we agreed that, you know, the movies, we like them to, to lesser or greater degrees, but we really think that Star Trek belongs on television. And so I think the first thing that you wonder when this new series was announced is, is, is this going to be in the old Star Trek universe or the new J.J. Abrams Star Trek universe? So, John, why don't you weigh, on this, weigh in on that? What do, you, do you have a strong preference one way or the other? Oh, well, I definitely have my own preferences. I mean, um, I imagine that this is probably going to be somehow related to the J.J. Abrams Trek. Like, like I, I, I heard one idea was that it might be sort of next generation uh, but set in the in the same alternate universe that the J.J. Abrams Trek 
uh, movies are set in. Um, and I'd be fine with that. I mean, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Next Generation has always been my trek. It's been my, um, you know, that I, I prefer that time period and I, and I prefer that crew and everything. That's, that, that was always, always been my favorite. But, um, I, I, uh, like personally, like I, I think I said this before. I mean, I, I, I would have loved to see like uh, a Star Trek with Data as captain or something like that. And the thing is, like, with, if we imagine that uh, it actually that the new show is actually going to be set in that same alternate universe that the J.J. Abrams movie has set up, um, we could do almost anything. We could bring back some of our uh, favorite characters from the old uh, Next Generation and, and repurpose them and do new interesting things with them in the same way that the J.J. Abrams movies were doing um, interesting, you know, uh, retakes on, on those original characters. Um, I'd be cool with seeing them try to do that with uh, Next Generation characters. Um, but do it in the sort of television format, the the you know the format that we're saying that uh, Trek uh, sort of excels in, as opposed to the the big you know sort of action movies that that the J.J. Abrams uh, movies turned into. Um, although I'm not super optimistic that we're gonna get any the the kind of cerebral Trek that that I want, uh, just given that um, the, it seems like the showrunner is somebody that who's worked on the movies with it with J.J. Abrams, so. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I, I, I want it to, I want to be optimistic, but I'm not quite that optimistic. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's Al, Alex Kurtzman is the, the guy from. Yeah. The... Yeah. I, I think John is right that basically, you know, with Kurtzman's involvement, um, and I think just from a business perspective, it's a shrewd move to keep it in the current cinematic universe because everyone now is all about these shared universes. And so I think it would make very little business sense to have it be anything else. So I think, yeah, featuring a next generation alternate, timeline cast would be fantastic that'd be a great way to relive those adventures yeah i guess i kind of feel that you know when when the jj abrams star trek movies were going on i was all on board with retelling the classic kind of trek stories but i feel like i'm kind of burned out on reboots and retellings at mm -hmm. the moment and i would really prefer that they just continue the story after star trek voyager and just have something mm -hmm. new and different uh i don't know keith do you have a perspective on that um, well, one, uh, just to, to jump to the Alex Kurtzman thing for a second, um, I, him being the producer of the show doesn't necessarily, I don't think, uh, mean that, uh, keep in mind that Kurtzman is also, was an executive producer on Fringe, uh, on the current show Scorpion, uh, Sleepy Hollow, uh, and, well, this isn't in its favor, but, uh, Hawaii Five-0, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and not, not, not exactly your deep intellectual show, but Limitless also, it's, he's, He's actually got a really good track record uh, on television, so I think that shouldn't be discounted. Um, so there is, I think, the possibility that we'll see that. I mean, his uh, there's a difference between the expectations of a tentpole science fiction movie or just a tentpole action movie versus the expectations of a TV show. And the the best Star Trek stories, the ones that people always talk about when they talk about Star Trek at its best are things like The City on the Edge of Forever, like The Trouble with Tribbles, like The Visitor, like Yesterday's Enterprise, The Inner Light. Um, the Inner Light, for know. sure. I was glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Stuff like that, that really digs into the characters and digs into how things affect people. Even, you know, like an action story like Balance of Terror or, um, you know, uh, something like that, where where it focuses on the consequences to the people as people and what it means, you know, the human cost of the adventures that they're having, you know, stuff like, uh, like what some of DS9's best episodes during the Dominion War, things like, um, in the pale moonlight. And, uh, in particular, um, it's only a paper moon, uh, where, where Nog is dealing with the trauma of losing his leg. So I think that that's the important thing. The rest of it, you know, I would me personally. I mean, if I would, if somebody, if Alex Kurtzman called me tomorrow and said, hey, Keith, I want you to give me an idea for, for what you want to see for Star Trek, which, of course, would never happen, uh, I would probably want to do something jumping the equivalent. I mean, Voyager ended in 2001, so something that would be 15 years later, um, you know, keeping in real time. So this way, you you know, if you're able to bring in characters from Next Gen DS9 or Voyager, they will have aged normally. <laughs> but... Um, but also jumping forward in the timeline a bit, maybe, you know, doing some sort of shakeup of the status quo similar to what Next Gen did with the Klingons being allies now. Um, and just, you know, dealing, dealing, moving forward. I think the biggest mistake that was made w with Enterprise was moving backward. Yeah. Um, I don't think that was the right. Star Trek has been at its best when it's moved forward. The motion picture jumped ahead a couple of years and, you know, 
beyond the original series. Next Gen moved 70 years beyond, and then after that, each subsequent show was continuing forward. Looking backward, really, I don't think is as useful. And and I think that's true of the, the Abrams films as well. Um, having said that, I have no... If, if, if it's going to be a new Star Trek series, I just want it to look and feel like a Star Trek series that does what Star Trek does best, whether that's in the Abrams uh, timeline or in the mainline timeline, whether it's in the 23rd century or the 24th century. Um, that's the most important thing, and that'll depend entirely upon what the writing staff is like. Well, I think it's a really interesting point, Keith, um, regarding the look and feel of it, because I think that's why, more than likely, it's going to tie into the alternate timeline of the movies. Because I think the problem with Enterprise, um, at least one of them, I mean, I actually enjoyed it quite a bit towards the end, but it, it felt outdated as it was airing in 2004 or five. Because it, it hadn't adopted the more modern style of Battlestar Galactica and even Stargate SG-1 to a degree. I think it just, you know, it felt a little stuffy and languid. And I think, you know, if you but it, shoot... By new... the, but by the same token, it also looked too advanced because it was supposed to be 100 years before the original series. Correct. Yes, you know? that was an inherent flaw. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I... I think it would be easier um, for the filmmakers to actually continue, like, if, if you're going to basically take the aesthetic that J.J. has created from the films to some degree and want to tie it into that universe, then I think keeping it tied into that is definitely better. Because if you were to bring back Picard and Cisco and all those classic characters 15 years later, that would be fascinating. I'd love to see it, but I think it would be a little strange to... You would have a disconnect somewhere, because if you started shooting it in a more modern style, then it wouldn't feel like the old Trek, but you'd have the old characters. You know what I mean? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, I was going to say, uh, admittedly, uh, the one of the reasons I, I sort of want it to be in the A in the AU is because I want Data as a captain, and and you know Brent Spiner's never going to do it. So it's like if we have AU, it's like oh, of course we have to recast him. And then um, also they ruined Data in in whatever the last movie was um, that had Data in it. Um, I, I I tried to block it out of my mind. Was it Nemesis? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. You know I, I I just hated that so much, and so um, you know uh, we we need some sort of uh, retconning in order to get Data back the the Data that we want. Um, of course, I mean there's any number of ways they could do that. You could you know find a copy of him from some other their alternate timeline whatever like you know there's a copy of Riker around so uh so anything is possible but oh yeah um, there's there's been both a comic book story and a novel story that came up with two different ways of bringing data back oh, so yeah great all right <laughs> perfect right. Well, I mean John mentioned that he wanted to see data as the captain and it seems like they had a thing going with um Deep Space 9 and Voyager where th- where they were having diversity among the captains mm-hmm. that they were introducing so I guess a robot would be diversity in that way but do you think that they should continue that trend and have some sort of um, diversity with the captain in this new series? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think it's vital, honestly. That, that it, it depresses me even... Here we are 20 years after Deep Space Nine, and you can count on one finger the number of leads of genre uh, TV shows that are not white men. Mm-hmm. Um, there's just an appalling lack of diversity. One of the things that was so great about Star Trek when it aired in the 60s was that at a time... When people were watching the news and seeing people who looked like Michelle Nichols uh, involved in civil rights unrest, people who looked like George Takei, who were – they were fighting in Vietnam, and people who sort of talked like Walter Koenig did, threatening to bomb us all the time, and they were all working together on the bridge and nobody even commented about mm-hmm. it. The fact that they were working together was was just assumed. Um, and that was incredibly radical in 1966. and. Avery Brooks being the lead of Deep Space Nine was incredibly radical in, in 1993. Um, Kate Mulgrew actually wasn't radical in 95 because we got a whole slew of really strong female characters uh, in genre shows in the 90s, but that's kind of tapered off. Um, it's We're starting to see a bit of a comeback of it uh, with it now, but they're absolutely, I mean, just in general, television needs our diversity, and, and Star Trek used to be a leader in that, and it would nice be nice if it was again. Yeah, actually, I mean, if you're going to sort of extend, you know, go go back to what they, they were doing um, with those different captains and, and uh, finding the thing that they haven't dealt with is like, I would say, well, you know, maybe you need to have a, a, a queer captain because uh, sort of uh, LGBTQ, um, uh, you know, representation in Star Trek, that's one thing that that's one area in which they've sort of been most lacking, I guess. Um, I mean, it's like they have dealt with it, but um, they haven't had a lot of main characters who had any sort of non um, traditional uh, gender roles or sexual preferences. 
You know, I wonder, guys, with the new film coming out in 2016, and this series is slated for January 2017, it's almost a missed opportunity. I, I guess Bad Robot is not involved with this film, because Alex Kurtzman is, of course, but I guess because J.J. jumped ship to Star Wars, but it would have been a perfect you know, situation to have Bad Robot produce this show, because then you really could have even segued from the films directly into the series, and you could have Sulu branch off, you know, leave the cinematic universe and have his own show or something. That would have been great, I think. That that could still be what would happen. <laughs> um, I mean, that that is one of the possibilities. Yeah, maybe that's the plot twist that they don't want to say, but I think that would be great. I mean, that would be my choice if out of all the scenarios. Well, because it was, it was always a big thing trying to get Sulu his own show, right? So they could they could kind of do that finally with the Excelsior. Yeah, and that way you have the movies and you have the show and they could keep tying it into each other directly. So, I mean, that seems like the best business model to me. It's certainly working fine with what Marvel's doing. I mean, that's the most obvious example. And to an extent, Star Trek did that in the late 80s and early 90s in particular. You know, they made an effort to tie... Um, Leonard Nimoy's appearance on Next Generation in, obliquely at least, with the Undiscovered Country. Um, and, you know, there were, you know, Deep Space Nine was making references to things that were going on uh, in the Next Generation movies and vice versa. So, you know, that that sort of thing, it, it, I think I think that kind of synergy would, would, be, would be smart <laughs> uh, and certainly be useful. And also, you know, one other thing that was mentioned briefly, if it's this, it's in the same timeline and in the same... Uh, time frame is that you can kind of save money on your show uh keep under budget by using some of the same sets and some of the same equipment and whatnot as well absolutely same uniform same costumes you know that that and that frees you up to do you know spend that budget on other things like you know getting a really 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 good writing staff so. <laughs> well actually keith speaking of that i mean you mentioned city on the edge of forever which was written by harlan ellison and a bunch of the original series episodes were written by prominent prose science fiction authors, uh, Theodore Sturgeon, Norman Spinrad, Robert Bloch. Do you think there's any chance that prominent prose science fiction writers today will be tapped to write Star Trek in the future? It'd be nice. Most of those guys had other screen credits. You know, the, the, it wasn't the first screen credit for any of them, I don't think, except maybe Spinrad. But um, and, and even then, I'm not, I'd have to look that up again because I, I don't remember. But I mean, Robert Bloch, Harlan uh, Ellison, and, and Sturgeon uh, had all done other screen work. It wasn't like they were just coming out of prose. There are some who do that. Um, Stephen Barnes, for example, has worked in both, and there's others floating around. So, I mean, I, I think it would be good if they did, certainly. Um, you know, there's there, and there's plenty of science fiction writers who have also done screenplays and who certainly, you know, should be open to selling things. I mean, it would be nice. I don't know if it'll happen. But Wait, well, why do you say they wouldn't tap you, Keith? I think Alex Kurtzman, if you're listening, Keith is available, man. Give him a call. <laughs> I have no screenwriting experience at all. I mean, I'd be happy to pitch, but it's it hasn't happened yet. And I've done, you know, I've written in 25 different licensed universes and nobody's asked me to pitch yet. So <laughs> yeah. Actually, if if Alex Kurtzman is listening, it's like, I know I had some harsh things to do here, but <laughs> seriously, you need to hire me to, like, oversee the scripts, right? Uh, okay, and if you do that, like, we'll totally make this awesome. Like, I can tell you, I can look at a script, a Star Trek script, and I can tell you whether or not it's going to suck. And I can tell you whether or not the science fiction community is going to tell you that it sucks. So like have me on board i'll vet everything ahead of time and we'll just we'll we'll nix all these terrible scripts beforehand you know and we won't we won't run into some of these uh you know like episode three of next generation issues <laughs> which is like the worst episode ever if you were to ask a bunch of fans or went to comic-con and asked people who they wish would be involved on the new series i'm sure that say ronald d moore that would be a name that would get that would come up a lot and it's almost too bad he's so busy with outlander right now it's a brilliant show but I would love to see him return to the Star Trek universe. Well, it's almost too bad that I've lost all faith in him after the ending of Battlestar Galactica, but otherwise I would agree with you. <laughs> but you know what? That uh, Touche. But um, I think you know, with Battlestar, I, I think it's highly important that the new series, no matter what it does, I think the most important thing is that it's highly serialized because you know the episodic nature of the prior incarnations, it was fine for the 80s and 90s. But I think, by and large, these days, we want a more serialized cliffhanger-type situation to keep people hooked. And it's just, it's, it's more interesting. I mean, that's what we've gotten used to, I think. And Ronald uh, Moore was at the, you know, at the front of that charge with Battlestar, because that was a brilliant yeah. show. I mean, most of it. Well, the episodic uh, is good for television 
in the old days when you were just tuning in whenever you had no idea if you were going to watch the episodes in order. But I mean, this new show, I think it's going to be online. Isn't it online? It's like CBS Access or something. So that's even a more reason to make it. CBS is trying to ape what Netflix and Amazon Prime are doing, basically. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, serialized show is uh, is essential. I think to make it feel like a modern show, because if it's just an episodic thing, yeah, it's going to feel like an like an artifact of the eighties or nineties. Because I mean, almost no serious dramas are actually done that way anymore, where they're just strictly episodic. Um, you know, even even some of the crime shows, which are essentially episodic, at least the characters grow and develop uh, to, and change uh, to an extent that we never saw on Star Trek. Because it, it, it was always so frustrating that like every Star Trek show would like end with everything returning back to normal so that if you missed an episode you wouldn't be lost ds9 um, did not do right. that ds9 was completely serialized actually especially once you got into the, like the third season but that was part and parcel of, of where it was set to some extent right you know it was in a and that's why it's so, so and it's so highly regarded for that reason i mean i i think actually ds9 is a good model because it was um i mean there were there were certain storylines that were he- heavily serialized but it also never lost track of telling at least one good story in the hour or if it was two part or in two hours. I think there's a, there's a good balance to be gained between, you know, having an ongoing storyline and ongoing character arcs where, and yet the individual stories are still more or less uh standalone, not standalone, but where, where you at least have a beginning and a middle and an end at the end at, and in each hour. And I think it's, you know, for, especially if it's going to be a ship based show, um, I think that's probably the best way to do it because they're going to be in constant motion. Do you guys think there's any chance that this new series is going to be optimistic? Because it seems like the way television has gone has just been darker, especially with you're talking about these serialized stories. It just seems like they lend themselves more to getting darker and darker and darker as they progress. I really hope they don't precisely because everything on television right now is darker. And if it's going to stand out from everything else, that's one way to do it. Yeah. I think Keith is right, um, because while there's a temptation there to go dark, you look at the two films so far in the reboot, and the first film was infinitely more popular. It was a more optimistic, fun ride, and the second film veered into modern topics, and it, it was dark, and it was just not as fun, you know? Right, but I mean, do you think the show should avoid modern topics? Because, I mean, like Keith was saying, that's one of the things that made the original Star Trek so enduring and significant. Yeah, it's just a question of tone. I mean, because what you want, ideally, is a combination of what we had with the original series and now the more modern storytelling aesthetics. But you want, you know, a well-written allegorical story that, you know, basically paints us in a positive light. I mean, even if we're dealing with dark issues, it's all a factor of tone, how it's portrayed, you know? Yeah, and, and Star Trek can be many different things without having to commit to one thing or the other. I mean, the original series had both the city on the edge of forever and the trouble with dribbles, you know, it had a piece of the action and it had a private little war, you know, um, it, you can do, you can do a variety of different types of stories. Um, even, you know, there, there's ways to do whimsical fun stories. There's ways to do optimistic stories and you can do stories that are cynical and depressing. Also, um, the world is big enough for that. One of the advantages and one of the reasons why it's really hard to speculate, the Star Trek universe at this point has gotten incredibly broad, which is, to my mind, a strength because it greatly increases the types of stories you can tell. One of the things I always thought that should have been done after Enterprise went off the air um, and instead they wound up going the, the movie route with Abrams, but I thought one of the things that they should have considered would be doing a series of miniseries, like six to eight episode miniseries jumping all over the Star Trek universe. You could do a, a six-episode miniseries of Sulu on the Excelsior. You could do Riker on the Titan. You could do, you know, uh, all sorts of different possibilities of, uh, you know, do a Klingon story, do a Romulan story, do a Vulcan story. That would be fun, yeah. I, I don't think 10 years ago that would have been realistic, but now that we have more anthologized TV, I mean, we have Sci-Fi's upcoming Channel Zero, and we have American Horror Story, we have... Yeah, you know, that that I think that'd be a great idea actually. Um to have yeah, different mini series set within the universe that'd be great. That would be interesting because of the possibilities of like getting people somebody like George Takei and everything where it's like, you know, he's not going to commit to like a, a regular ongoing show. I mean, he, you know, he's already in his 80s. The the network probably also wouldn't want to uh, you know, cast somebody at that age to play such an important role but you know, if you're talking about like six or eight episodes and where you know, you go in and you do it, you can finish it in a pretty restrained time period and that way the actor also isn't committing a, a whole bunch of like you know his of years of his life to this project then you know you might be able to do something like that 
So, yeah, that could be really interesting. Well, Keith, you mentioned Vulcans, and I mean, one of my things on my wish list is actually we had um, Julia Galef on the show in episode 88, and she was talking about this thing that really bothers her called the Straw Vulcan, where they make the kind of logic that the Vulcans use seem sillier than it is in real life or than it would be. And it seems like every Star Trek series, they have a character who is torn between being logical and being human, and they gradually move in the direction of being human. And I think it would be good if they had a character who starts out human and moves in the other direction to become more and more robotic <laughs> and more and more logical as the sh series progresses. Yeah, well, the funny thing is that Data was basically kind of perfect, and, and yet he was always aspiring to be human. It's like he he had he didn't have the the illogical uh you know thoughts that humans have, and and yet he always aspired to be what we were. Whereas uh, as Dave was noting that uh, actually the he was probably just better off staying where he started. Uh, so that's one of my things on the wish list. Actually, how do you guys feel about uh, time travel, parallel worlds? It seems like just from reading comments, it seems like people are really split on this. I mean, a lot of people were saying they thought it would be cool. There was apparently there was one episode of Voyager I never saw where there are these time ships from the 30th century from the future yeah. that police yeah. the timeline or something. Does anyone have any interest at all in seeing something like that on a Star Trek TV show? Absolutely. You took the words out of my mouth. I, I love that episode. And and I love time travel within the Star Trek universe. But I, I do agree with you that a lot of fans are really over it. So I think that would be a tricky one. I'm fine with it in general if it's just like part of the ongoing thing and it's not like that's not what the show is about. Like I wouldn't want the show to be all about that. Um, but I mean, if if it shows up now and then, like that's fine. Um, although, uh, I could also be perfectly happy without it. Like if it just focused on other types of science fiction, uh, sort of storylines. Um, I mean, like, I think when I talked about Star Trek previously, like a lot of my favorite episodes were, um, the, the, the science puzzle ones, uh, things like cause and effect or, um, or, or various episodes like that, where, you know, the crew is faced with this, uh, strange scientific, uh, mystery and they have to figure out how to solve it. And so, um, I, I'd be much more interested in, in more stuff like that. And that's the kind of stuff that you're never going to see in the movies because it's sort of more cerebral and more, and it's a slower sort of storyline, uh, doesn't, isn't full of all the action and everything. But, um, you know, if they, if they can figure out some kind of thing like that that involves time travel, then sure, do it. But if it's just time travel to just mess around with timelines and stuff, like, I, I'm, I'm, I don't really care about that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too excited about that. It would be interesting if they could use that anthologized notion of the miniseries and give us at least one six to eight episode um, run in the 31st century or wherever they were from in that episode. I mean, I would I would love to see the Federation Starfleet in the far future. That'd be great. I think I, I, I John pretty much answered what I was going to say, because um, <laughs> I, 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 I agree with him. I, I think some of the best Star Trek episodes are basically for all intents and purposes, Stargate SG-1 episodes, where you've got, you know, some sort of high adventure problem solving thing where, where they have to, you know, they have this problem and they have to figure out, think their way through it to solve it. Um, the, the, in fact, that was what we were doing. I, I had never seen, I, had, I didn't start watching Stargate SG-1 until after I was doing the Starfleet Corps of Engineers series. And I'm really grateful for that because then I would have thought I was ripping them off because <laughs> we had actually developed that independently as the, the same sort of thing. It's a bunch of, of engineers, not just engineers, but also um, cultural specialists and, and linguists and such who uh, traveled around on a small ship, basically solving the problems of the, you know, fixing stuff that needs fixing in the galaxy. Um, and it was, and it was very much like SG-1 and, and Atlantis were, where, where you've got, you know, a bunch of specialists going around uh, fixing stuff. And and that sort of fun problem solving science fiction is it, it works really well in a television format first of all, and and also yeah uh, time travel shenanigans are are some uh, is a well Star Trek has gone to very often and it's definitely something that's fun to do occasionally. Um, making it the focus of the show would I think be disastrous. Uh, they they sort of tried that with Enterprise with the whole temporal Cold War thing and it completely crashed and burned. And and I don't and and I think it's considering that time travel has been at the heart of far too many Star Trek stories at this point, and it's hard to find a, a way of doing it that will feel fresh, just because they've done it so many times with the Voyage Home, with with the whole setup of the first Abrams film, First Contact, uh, you know, <laughs> City on the Edge Forever, Yesterday's Enterprise, you know, so many so uh, uh, Future's End on Voyager. There are just so many so many time travel stories. That's an important point, actually, that since the alternate universe itself is based on a time travel story, you wouldn't necessarily want to do any more branching off of that. That gets problematic quickly. 
I mean, I saw a bunch of people online suggesting that maybe instead of one ship, they should have a battle group of ships, sort of like in Battlestar Galactica, and maybe make it a little bit more realistic where the, the Admiral doesn't go down to fight aliens on the surface of the planet. Um, I don't know, what do, you, do you think that that would make it not feel like Star Trek, or do you think that that's a direction Star Trek should go and make it a little bit more realistic? No, I mean, I think that would be cool. I mean, and, you know, especially like if you uh, if you have a, a sort of uh, an admiral figure, you could have somebody maybe like one of the old uh, sort of actors from one of the previous series. You could you could have them in that role and have them just, uh, you know, sort of in the background, but there and present and, and sort of, um, you know, uh, not going on all the away missions, but still uh playing an important role, uh, you know, you know, making important decisions and everything. Um, so that, that could be kind of interesting. And then, you know, have, uh, the sort of younger, more, um, more fit and, and whatever, uh, members going on the away missions and, and leave, leave the, the older experienced people, uh, safely on the ship and, and everything. I, I like the idea of it being more than one ship. Um, I'm thinking in particular, there was a novel series that, that, Simon and Schuster did called Vanguard, which was an original series era thing, which involved a new region of space that had just been discovered. Vanguard was the station at the center of it, and there were a couple of there were three ships that were assigned to it, and so you could you can tailor the storytelling depending on the needs of of the needs of the story. Depend you can use whichever ship is appropriate. Um, you know, I mean, I remember there was one episode of Next Gen uh, where where they were doing a supply run to a two person outpost on the Klingon border. This is the flagship of the Federation with a thousand people on it, a whole bunch of, of science labs supposed to be seeking out new life and new civilization, and they're doing a job that should be done by a small transport that has six people on it. You know? Um, but that's the main ship, so that's what they had to do. So I like the idea of something where you've got like three different ships of three different types with three different crews on it. You can have a you know, this way you can have an ensemble. Um, and you can tell different stories depending on which ship you're using. You can do something more appropriate for a big capital starship that's flying out. You can do a smaller, more mobile ship that's, you know, more of a battleship type thing. Um, and, and, and also, you know, have a base back on the station, which th that would be like the center point, which would be, you know, enable you to do ongoing storylines because you're, you have at least one static location. So there's going to be ongoing plot lines that way as well. I guess I'll provide a, a quick counterpoint to that. I, to tell you the truth, I don't think I, I hope it doesn't go in that direction at all. Um, to me, that just wouldn't feel like Star Trek. Uh, I feel like it would be getting away from the personal stories that I'm hoping they get back to. I mean, I agree with you logically about a lot of these points, but I guess there's just something to me that's special about the lone ship out in the universe going boldly where no one's gone before. And I, you know, you get accustomed to the crew of, six to seven main characters and you don't want it to feel you know static or we've been there already but i i do think like when you have like a whole squadron or battalion or multiple ships i mean because you can have smaller ships you know from the main ship you know the shuttlecraft but um i don't know to me i i think that would be a really tricky one to pull off i'm I'm just not seeing it i didn't even think of it until it was mentioned just now so that was just <laughs> although one other um thing i would like to see very much would like to see, and it probably won't happen, but I really, 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 really want to see it, is a ship that only has, like, 40 people on it. Because I am... One of the most frustrating things to me is that we've got this ship with... Initially, and I think Voyager had, like, 250 people on it. Uh, the Enterprise had... The original Enterprise had 430 people. The Enterprise-D had 1,000 people on it. And it's like, for crying out loud, you've got all these people on the ship, and the same seven people do everything. <laughs> yeah. You know... Um, I, it would be nice to have just a smaller ship that where, where everybody can be involved and it doesn't look ridiculous, you know, where everybody has more than one job to do because it's a small crew. And also it would be different from what we're used to on Star Trek. Anyhow, you know, a small, tight crew, you know, everybody knows everybody else, everybody's sort of, you know, working together. Um, and you don't feel like there's a whole bunch of extraneous people who spend all their time wandering the corridors and not actually doing anything important. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I, I think that's the that's the way to go, if you ask me, actually. Just minimize the crew as much as possible, make it a smaller ship that's more vulnerable. You know, that way there's a, you know, there's more at stake all the time and they're just out there on their own exploring. All right, so I saw one, one suggestion I saw for this new show that I thought was really interesting online is it said the entire ship's interior should be a holodeck. And I thought that was kind of cool. I mean, especially if this is going to be set 
in the future, you know, after Voyager, say 100 years after Voyager, to have this really like high tech ship where it's all this big virtual inf- reality environment and there's all sorts of, um, you know, like the doctor from Voyager, but that's like half the crew or something. Hmm. That actually could be interesting in terms of instrumentation. They've already shown that they can create fully working instruments on the holodeck, uh, machinery and such. And the idea that it's that the, sh- the interior of the ship is adjustable, basically, is actually a really cool idea. Yeah, I don't know if you need to go full holodeck, but it would be interesting if you saw some of the technology you see in other things like um, the Matrix sequels or 12 Monkeys, where it's kind of a virtual reality interface, but with real equipment, if that makes sense. I'm just saying, you know, computer, give me uh, this console and it appears, you know, mm-hmm. and if you don't need the and if you don't need the console, you can get rid of it for the time being. One person I saw said, can they just remake Voyager, but do it right? That premise was perfect. Um, it no, really um, wasn't. No, <laughs> it wasn't. The, the biggest problem with Voyager's premise is it is basically the only way the show works is if your heroes constantly fail. Yeah. Um, they have to constantly not get home and they have to keep trying to get home because duh. Um, but they have to keep failing to get home because if they get home, the show's over. And yeah, you know, that Voyager is the perfect premise for a movie. That's a movie premise. And as a TV show, unless, you know, you, and the problem is they didn't embrace it either because there was never any sense that there was, there was any kind of hardship to what they were doing. I mean, it, I mean, there is a, there, there are ways to do Voyager better than they did it. And and they did have some interest. You know, I agree with Roth at least in so far as they had some interesting characters, um, but they never really embraced their premise properly. And, and again, it's not really suited to television anyway because you don't want to. Nobody wants to show, watch a show where your heroes are failing all the time. Well, I'm going to agree with you and disagree with you, Keith, because <laughs> I did really like the premise of Voyager. I, it, you know, it's basically Star Trek crossed over with Lost in Space, and I really that's appealing to me. The idea that the whole mission is to get home. But actually, that's paradoxically problematic because it always bothered me a little bit. The whole point of Starfleet is to boldly go and explore and have brave new adventures. They've made it farther than any other human being ever has. And their first instinct is to go back. Like, that's troubling. They should see that as like, wow, you know, this is a blessing and a curse, but this is our destiny to explore this quadrant. Like, we're just going to hang out here and send back the, the data if we can or, you know, at least just. Be, be explorers. That's what they're paid to do. We're not paid, but, you know. See, well, one person, I'm kind of curious about this. So, so one person online said that they thought that maybe CBS was going to the video on demand route for this new Star Trek show because of the house entangled all the TV rights had become. And it says multiple companies own different TV rights and none of them share the same vision and all of them are hell bent on denying the others any sort of traction. I was just curious if anybody has any idea about that. I don't think that's actually true, but even if it is, I mean, if it was true, then they couldn't get it on the air at all. Um, the the I, I think, honestly, that CBS is just seeing, they're seeing what's happening with Hulu and Netflix and Amazon Prime and viewing it as the wave of the future. And just as previously, um, they used Star Trek to launch their network, Paramount used uh, Star Trek to launch their network in 1995, um, they're using Star Trek to launch... You know, and for that matter, 1966, uh, uh, Desilu was using um, Star Trek to show how awesome TV in color was, um, and and Star Trek: The Next Generation was put in syndication to show you know when there was the only things that were syndicated that were in first run syndication in 1987 were game shows. Um, Star Trek: The Next Generation was one of the first uh, first run syndicated shows where it was done that way in first run, and it opened the door to a huge number of shows like that. It eventually tapered off because um, more networks developed instead. But, and, you know, again, Voyager was used to launch the United Paramount Network in 1995. This is just in keeping with what Star Trek has always done. Um, Even (laughs) back in 2000, the Starfleet Corps of Engineers series we did, uh, we launched specifically as a tie-in with Microsoft Reader, uh, which was the the hot new way to read e-books in in the year 2000, uh, before there were Kindles and things. And, you know, so I I think using that as... A uh, platform to launch their attempt at <laughs> their version of Netflix is in keeping with how his, how Star Trek has historically been done, which makes sense because I mean people are moving away from cable um, all the time, so I think they are just keeping with the times and a sci-fi technological show is the best way to do that. I'm sure they feel. Um, I think what's going to be problematic is people aren't going to necessarily want to pony up six dollars a month for CBS online, but you're going to have a lot of people sharing 
passwords like they do for Netflix and HBO Go unless they can figure out how to stop that. But other than that, I mean, it's a good idea because, I mean, I'm going to have to pay for it. I mean, I want to see it. So. Yeah, I mean, it makes a certain amount of sense uh, in the in the sense that, um, you know, uh, Star Trek fans and, and science fiction nerds, uh, I mean, we're going to go and find it wherever it is. Like, I mean, if we have to subscribe to some new service, I mean, we're going to watch our Star Trek. We're not going to be, we're not going to be kept away from our Star Trek because of a like $6 monthly fee. You know, it's like, we got to get our Star Trek. Um, and, uh, I mean, at least, at least yes. for the first couple episodes. And then if it sucks, then we're going to bail. But, um, you know, uh, and then we'll tell everybody how much it sucks and, uh, and they'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll rule the day. Um, I'm telling you, Alex Hertzman, like hire me. Like, you know, we can prevent this. We can stop this from happening. You know, I've been to that alternate universe where you didn't hire me and, and it's, it's a terrible place. I mean, and it really sucks for you and you, you know, I can help. So just let me know. Call me. So, so John, you are planning on paying the $6 a month to watch Star Trek? Oh yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, unless I have some sort of, uh, financial crisis that prevents me from, you know, uh, spending my discretionary income in such a manner. But, um, you know, I mean, cause the thing is, it's like, I mean, I don't actually want CBS online for any other particular reason. Um, you know, I have regular cable, so I mean, I, I don't really need instant access to every CBS show. Um, but I mean, if that's the only place I can get it, I, I would get it. Um, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a write off, uh, since I'm going to be getting it strictly for Star Trek, but, um, you know, uh, it would be, I would rather just get it for free. I mean, I really should get it for free. I mean, it's like, you know, given, uh, all the things I edited and produced the podcast and everything. And it's like, come on, <laughs> but you know, we don't know anybody at CBS. So we, we got to get somebody from CBS. I mean, you know, I mean, once, once I become Alex Kurtzman's right hand man, I mean, I'm sure I'll be able to get it for free, but you know, until then, the, th the thing that scares me about this is that it's, like, so important for Star Trek right now for this to succeed. Because, like, if this doesn't succeed, we're, like, never going to see another Star Trek show for, like, for, for forever. Um, I mean, look how long it was since we had one even already. And that was with, and that was even with, uh, it's shifting to movies and everything. It's, like, it just seems like we're, we're never, it's, like, all we're going to get is, is, is Star Trek, uh, being done as movies, which, as we've said, is not, does not actually feel like Star Trek. So, um, I'm really, I'm really worried that it's not going to work. And then, and then it's going to be the end of Star Trek on television forever. Well, even the films can't go on indefinitely. I mean, how many films are those cast members contracted to? I mean, I feel like this third film is going to close out the trilogy. And then honestly, if they are smart, they should just continue it through the show, um, in some way, shape or form. I mean, most of those guys are TV actors anyway. I mean, not Chris Pine, but Zachary Quinto. I mean, why can't he be on a weekly show for CBS? playing Spock. I don't know. Okay, so uh, one other comment I saw in line that really stuck with me is uh, Cross of Coronado says, I just don't believe that in 2015 it's even possible to make a good Star Trek series. The audience is too stupid. Hmm. And I don't know if you guys saw this thing. There's this um, meme going around where apparently NBC initially, this is for the original series, they rejected it after watching the pilot because they said it was too cerebral. And Lucille Ball somehow pulled strings and, and got them to take it. It was slightly more complicated than that, but yeah. And, and Too Cerebral was not the only note. They also didn't like, um, they didn't think that, um, some of the actors were really up to snuff. They really didn't like Spock, although Roddenberry stuck to his guns on that. That was obviously the right choice. Um, the Too Cerebral note is the one Roddenberry always talked about at conventions, but there were actually lots of, of issues they had with the original pilot. Um, but they, they took the unusual step of commissioning a second one, and that one they liked a lot better. Huh. All right. Well, I guess the meme is maybe a little oversimplified. Yeah. Like who would have thought? Uh, also, the, the, <laughs> the comment you quoted was also stupid because I mean, there's a lot more intelligent television on the air now than there was 20 years ago, and and certainly more than there was 40 years ago. Um, there's 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 a lot more television, which also means there's a lot of stupid television just as well. But there's there's a lot of you know there's a lot of stuff on the air that that you never nobody would have even dared attempt. Um, you know, 25, 30 years ago, you know. Well, I think at the heart of that comment, though, perhaps he's touching on the fact that so many classic episodes, like All Good Things, um, it's a really, you know, intelligent two-part episode that's almost like hard to understand the first time through. You know, the reverse time, um, I forget what it was called exactly. Anti-time, and it wasn't end... hard to understand, it just didn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I say this as somebody who loved All Good Things, but... Um, that was basically some stuff they came up with so they could justify telling things in three different time frames. Right. But, you know, the thing is, at least they tried. I mean, it, 
you know, when you look at the new movies, for instance, they reference things very simplistically and they just throw out words like black hole and red matter and expect people to just buy it. And the thing is, they do mostly. Um, so because I think, you know, a common complaint of the pre previous you know iterations was too much techno babble. And which is which is kind of a bummer because as a science guy, like I really loved all that stuff. I mean, sometimes it gets overboard and it's nonsensical, but I like that they were trying, you know, and I hope they still do. I hope they try and make it, you know, interesting on a scientific level and don't just make it about like, you know, jockeying around the galaxy, having fun and blowing things up. Yeah, you know, Star Trek historically has at least tried to abide by the rules of our universe and physics, and I, I appreciate that. And the newer films have completely ignored that with stuff like trans warp beaming. It just gets really fantastical to the point where it's not even really, you yeah, know, trans warp beaming was was originally on Next Generation. That was, was in the seven season episode of Next Generation called Bloodlines. Yeah. Ah, okay. I'll hmm. have to go back and check that out because it really doesn't make any sense. Oh, it at makes least no not sense. the way it was produced. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it made no sense in that episode either, and it was forgotten after that. And it should have stayed that way. <laughs> right. So, John, so, so say I have my, my ideal Star Trek where there's like a queer captain and then there's like a half Vulcan guy and he just goes full Vulcan and there's a robot and he just goes full robot. <laughs> Do you think that could be a hit show or am I just like not, not a uh, chance? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it's hard to say. I mean, it, it, it's all going to depend on the writing and then how well they execute everything and how seriously they uh, really take everything. Um, I mean, I think I bounce off of a lot of science fiction shows just because it's like it feels very sort of slapdash, like in terms of uh, the sort of craft elements, like, you know, the dialogue is weak or the acting isn't very good or the direction is sort of like sort of phoned in, you know, there, it, it's like it's all going to depend on how all of the elements of the show come together. And I and, I, and you know, um, sure, it could. But I mean, it, it's all going to depend on all those things. Like, I don't think those uh, elements that you mentioned are, are going to make or break the show. Um, it's going to be how everything else comes together. It's whether or not they have you, John, as the advisor. <laughs> That's what's going to make or break the show. Exactly. Well, obviously. And there's no single element that you mentioned that can't happen because, I mean, we've had, you know, bisexual and gay and, and queer characters in sci-fi already that are wildly popular. I mean, jo Jack Harkness from Torchwood. So, mm -hmm. All right. So we're, we're pretty much out of time. Does anyone have any, any items on their Star Trek wish list they want to throw out that we haven't gotten a chance to talk about yet? I would very much like... I, and I and I mentioned this before to some extent, but just in general, I would like some real genuine thought going into the casting and making it look like it's a cast of people that come, the humans at least, come from a united Earth. Um, to not automatically default to the whitewashed stereotype. Um, you know, the this is this is supposed to be a united Earth where where the Asian population is considerably higher than the Caucasian population, and maybe reflect that. You know, reflect that there are people with brown skin in the world and, and show, have more of them in prominent roles. Um, I would really love to see, you know, another African-American or, you know, dark skinned, at least lead uh, just because there's so damn few of them. Um, and, and start, you know, one of the things that Star Trek has always been good for is giving, you know, showing a future where you don't have to be a white guy in order to be successful. There are so many people, not just African-Americans who saw Nichelle Nichols uh, and were inspired by her, uh, including most famously, you know, Whoopi Goldberg and Dr. Mae Jemison, both of whom, you know, were inspired by the presence of Aurora on the Enterprise. But there are a lot of Asian Americans who were just as inspired by Sulu. Um, you know, that and that sort of representation, Star, Star Trek is at its best when it gives people hope. And that's one way the new show really, I hope, will do that. And the fact, you know, that, that one other, you know, thing that, that, that Kurtzman's track record is good for on the shows he's been on is that is pretty diverse casting. Um, one of the best characters on television right now is Abby Mills on Sleepy Hollow, who is a black woman, um, and who's a phenomenal character. Um, and, and I'm hoping that sort of, uh, of thoughtful casting, uh, will be the norm on this show. I hope so as well. I mean, I loved, uh, the captain for the USS Kelvin they had in that new Star Trek film. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, more characters like that would be great. I mean, for me, I just desperately hope that the new Star Trek series can finally be as good as all the shows it's influenced and spawned, you know, that came after. <laughs> because because Star Trek is the original, it's the template, and, you know, it's always going to be socially relevant and, and wildly popular, hopefully. But um, I agree that there's so much writing on the 50th anniversary, the film, the series, that they have to get it right this time, or we could be looking at a lot of downtime. <laughs>
Uh, well, you know, my wish list is like, well, given that we can't have a J.J. Abrams involved, uh, we should at least have another J.J.A. involved. And <laughs> Alex Kurtzman gave me a call. I'm available. Um, I'm really busy right now, but I'll make time for this. Um, I know it's really important to me, and uh, I'm sure it's important to you as well. So, like, call me. Well, if you guys, if you guys, if 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 all of you guys get hired, don't leave me behind. <laughs> I'll I'll even transwarp beam over if I have to. <laughs> All right, so I think that's a good note to end on. So we've been speaking with John Joseph Adams, Raphael Jordan, and Keith DeCandido. So guys, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Shaka when the walls fell. Because I'm tight. <laughs> and that was our panel. So big thanks again to John Joseph Adams, Raphael Jordan, and Keith DeCandido for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes including Jamie Lord, Thick McRunfast, and Matt Gunterman. Matt writes, This podcast has been a welcome addition to my listening life, and I look forward to its arrival each week. It's introduced me to a host of writers who are new to me, David Bar Kirtley, the host, numbering among them, and also spurred my interest in new corners of the genre. I especially enjoy hearing about the career paths of the host and his guests, the workshops they've attended, the professional networks they've built, the friendships they've relied on, the setbacks they've suffered, and the serendipities they've enjoyed. The takeaway lesson for me is that some people get luck and others just work really hard. It's a fascinating listen. So big thanks again to Matt Gunterman for that great review. And of course, a special thank you to Bjorn Borison and Joshua Wood, who both just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, Please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd prefer to make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I'd like to give a special thank you to Total Films in Australia, who just made a very generous contribution to the show. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. Big thanks as well to listeners Juan San Miguel and Martin Carlberg, as well as to the members of the R Television subreddit, whose comments helped inspire today's topics. I'd also like to thank our sponsor for today's show, Luke Skywalker Can't Read and Other Geeky Truths by Ryan Britt. Learn more at ryanbrittwriter.com. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, Visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening. <laughs>